What's up, everybody? Uh, Michael Lee, back with his life, and I'm reversing the roles today. The guy I'm having on today, Mr. Scott Pratt from Horny Deer Sense, we actually met while I was on his podcast. So I figured it's the only the polite thing to do is return the favor. It feels a little awkward. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you know, you've got two guys that do podcasts. When we're, we're recording this on video, too. We're both sitting here with our podcast microphone, our little filters on there, got our headphones in, and all this fine, dandy stuff. And now it's like, okay, what, See, what do we do now? <laughs> that's, that's, and that's what, what worried me. And like for everybody listening, you know, Mike and I, we've been looking at each other for 10 minutes, getting ready to boot this thing off. And neither one of us wants to talk about anything because we don't want to waste anything that we might talk about. <laughs> and we'll have these phone conversations. And every time we're like, that should have been a podcast. That should have been a podcast. So I'm literally last night thinking about doing this. And I'm like, what if we get connected and just have nothing to talk about like out of all the things that we've covered what if it's just blah and i i, I kind of i lost a little bit of sleep about it <laughs> well i lost a little bit of sleep last night because i spent all day yesterday building a daggum well all right long story short and, and we're not even talking about a podcast yet this is a normal michael and scott conversation right here <laughs> So when we bought our house, there was a, a cube of bricks left over right here by the house. So I personally unstacked those bricks, stacked them here on my overhang behind my barn to protect these bricks. And we had an outdoor fireplace built, and we had, like, a cube of bricks left over. Like, I, who, whoever budgeted on the bricks did not do very well because we had plenty of excess. They weren't going to run out. Exactly. So, but when we built the outdoor fireplace, we matched the bricks with the bricks at the house. And, you know, you got to match things together. So we had these left over. And, and when the guys got through with the outdoor fireplace, they wheeled them over on a hand truck over here by these other bricks. So I've got all these bricks and they're, they're right on the outside edge. So they're getting hammered by the rain and the weather. So Michael decides we need to, I need to move these bricks where they're, you know, going to be preserved better. So under the, <laughs> under the overhang back here, the lean to on the back of this barn is just, 40 feet long michael moves by hand one by one well i put a finger in each uh two uh, one finger in each of two bricks at the time so i'm moving four bricks at a time and i move well over 500 bricks dude from from oh, one stack to other you brought that on yourself I did. I'm, I'm my OCD kicks in. I can't help that. So I move all these bricks over and stack them against you know a little sheltered spot. Well, to, to uh, this is supposed to be a short story, but we you know we, we did some podcasts. We can talk long as we want to until you've got to go to work today. <laughs> I, I'm not even going to pull up my calendar. If I, if I miss something, we miss something. So my wife is I, I, I love her to death, and she's she's cheap on some things and so I, I pick and choose my battles and i'm getting somewhere with these bricks so just hold the thought yeah <laughs> so in our backyard we, we had a patio port after we bought the house with a lot and we've been and she instead of putting in a pool like most women want oh i want a pool i want an in-ground pool that's going to cost me a minimum of probably thirty thousand dollars so minimum. i can lay beside it yeah, well that, she'll get in float around you know yeah. i mean whatever hey <laughs> yeah. she's happy she's happy <laughs> <laughs> but instead of going that route, and I use the, you know, hey, you know, this is something, money, a pool is something you dig a hole in the ground and keep putting money into it. That, that's how this thing works. I like, Absolutely. You know, blah, blah, blah. I'm not knocking pools. I like pools, but I just don't want one I got to take care of. Exactly. So, so at our previous house, she had a stock tank pool. And for those out there listening who don't know what a stock tank pool is, basically a bunch of rednecks that have cows figured out that you can just go get in these watering tanks that you have well water or windmill water, whatever, wherever you live, running water into these stock tanks out of the ground, which is fresh, clean water. You just get in that and cool off in the summer. And so this turned, this turned into a trend, especially during COVID, because you couldn't find one anywhere. Right. And you ha and everybody's making these stock tank pools. Google stock tank pools on, on the web when you get a oh, chance. And you, that's, on my, that's on my wife's list. Like, it, I'm, it's I'm, happening. I'm, Get her one today. I'm telling you, this will help you greatly. 
You can go hunting whenever you want to all summer. I'm going fishing. Okay, I'll be at my pool, my tank. I'm telling you, it's, it's well worth the, the, the $500, $600. I remember seeing the pic. Honestly, right about the time you posted the picture of yours, uh, she was already talking about it. And I remember showing her the picture of yours. And that just, you know, it was sealed at that point. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> well, wait till you see this. So I'm getting somewhere with the bricks. Oh, let's do it. So, so the stock tank pool, like, so the, the, the last one we had was, was the galvanized, me, you know, aluminum, metal, steel, whatever, whatever the hell they're made of. I don't know. I mean, I'm not a damn poolologist. Yeah. So they, they, but what, what I want, aluminum, I think what they are, but I would tell everybody this, if you get an aluminum one, before you use it, coat it with like flex seal or something, okay. like some, some, something real durable. And one, you'll, you'll prevent it from having any leaks or whatever. But two, those things will rust so fast when you put chlorine in there. Well, oh, one year, really? you'll, have, you'll have a rust tank pool in the, with chlorine. The chlorine and that iodized metal does not work well together. So we ended up at the old one, we uh, would drain it and we coated it with, I mean, paint rolled on this Flex Seal white sealer stuff. And um, it worked. But man, it was a pain. We had to put like twenty eight thousand coats of this stuff on. Oh my goodness! So, so it, it was it was worth it, but it wasn't. So with with and and you can only we can only find an eight foot diameter stock tank, like a tractor supply and stuff like that down here. So when we got this new one, we we upgraded to ten foot, but we're we're using the blue um, poly tank that you can get at Agri Supply, and you can get I think you can get a tractor supply too. We got Agri Supply down here. So the blue, and the blue's 10 foot, so it's, it's bigger, more room. Um, I don't know why, I mean, you could get like four people in there, I guess, if I hadn't tried it, but that, that's probably <laughs> about right. Um, but you save a little bit of money, and you get more size. So that's always a good thing. But, so we've got this poly tank now that we put on the patio. And I had to pour this patio uh I mean, it's a minimum of six inches thick on one end, probably closer to a foot on the other end. Dang. So it's, it's a solid. And, and then we yeah. built the fire, fireplace on it, so it, it held all these bricks. So we're back to the bricks. So we had these bricks left over from all the, from the house and from the projects, blah, blah, blah. So then now we got now, now that the patio's got the fireplace on it, I got my grill and you know, we got a couple chairs, all that stuff. Now we got to have somewhere for the tank. The tank won't go on the patio anymore. Like this, just we won't go with the fireplace. So where we had a fire pit that Michael spent, well, I say Michael and others, so that had help. <laughs> we put about eight thousand bags of rocks. I don't yeah, think it was buddy. 8, but we moved, put all these rocks in there, landscape timbered around, and had a fire pit there. We don't need a fire pit anymore. So Michael's got some thoughts here. This is this is the longest damn story. I'm that really, I, didn't, didn't I hope the payoff is there. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Enough. So when they, when they built the fireplace, for some reason, we needed like two tons of sand to build a fireplace. So we've got a mountain of sand left over. So I had a buddy of mine down here. He had a, he brought his tractor down here to get worked on. And while I was here, I said, Hey, come over to the house and help me move some sand. So we got this sand and we, we smoothed it over these rocks where the fire pit used to be. To put the tank on top because you, you got to have you need okay. to smooth the surface and you don't want rocks poking in the bottom of your tank with the weight of right. the water and it makes a mess. So I, this is this is a thought process in this thing. <laughs> now another caveat when we bought this house, the guy that we bought it from or the husband and wife we bought it from, they started running a, a split rail fence down. 300 yards of the property line here and then i guess they got what well, they decided that was not an economical thing to do so they put all the four by fours in the ground down this side now they we got split rail across the front but they, they went down the side then they changed their mind and they put they planted silverberry bushes which grow giant so instead they put all these silverberry bushes they, they left the four by fours just sitting and stick up in the ground i said this is the weirdest looking thing ever so i pulled what? up i pulled up all the four by fours that were, that were just sitting here. They were all cut at like 72 inches or 71 inches. I don't know. They're, they're all six, about six foot four by fours. Yeah. So I, I pulled up like 50 or 60 of these things. So now I've got a big stack of four by fours, big stack of bricks, and I got a stock tank 
Polly Stock Tank sitting on a pile of sand here in the yard. So, my wife's like, okay, I've got to get my tank ready for summer. It's coming. So, she's on Home Depot and Lowe's looking up all these pavers that are like $10 a square foot. I'm like, hey, we got bricks and 4 by 4s What do we need pavers for? <laughs> yeah. So, here comes yesterday. <laughs> so, we pull up the landscape timbers around the sand rock bed where the tank's sitting now. The tank's empty, by the way. So it's, okay. not, it's, not, it's not time to put water in it yet. It's too cold still. So we frame in around the sand with 4 by 4s We 4 by 4 out, and, a, and, and, and we've got basically a giant rectangle with a dividing line roughly in the middle. The tank area is a little about 4 feet wider. Got the tank in the middle of that, and then we've got like if you made uh, took took a square, a rectangle, and drew a plus in it, so it's four sections. There's 126 okay. bricks in each of those sections right now. There, so that was your weekend. That that was yesterday. Saturday oh. we, it was windy and we we're freezing to death, so we didn't do anything outside. So yesterday it was nice. So we, we 126 times four. That's 504. What do your fingers feel like today? Actually, they're really good because I think my muscle memory developed when I moved those bricks the first <laughs> time, first two times I moved them. So I'm good now. Like I, I really, I feel like my hands are in shape for, for moving bricks for the rest of my life. It sounds like a pain, but it also sounds like it's coming together beautifully. It's, it's uh, I was thoroughly impressed with how it turned out. And like, oh. the, could we? And that's after we, both of us, we, we pressure washed all those four by fours because they've been, you know, stuck in the ground and stuck in a pile. So we pressure washed all those, pressure washed the bricks after we got all them set. Then she decided to pressure wash. She, she got her, her little lounge chairs, you know, little tea right. lounge chairs. So we had to pressure wash. I mean, I'm like, I'm going to bed. <laughs> that, it, but you know, you got on it at the right time. Yeah, she's happy. You got turkey season coming up. Like, oh yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. the timing. Yeah, well done, sir. Well, that's what I'm saying. So, anybody that's listened to the first five minutes or so of this podcast and like, what in the hell am I listening to this for? It's really to make your wife happy. The yeah. Moral of the story is, if you buy your wife a stock tank and make her a pool in the backyard out of it, if you don't already have a pool, if you do have a pool, then just you can turn the damn thing off, I guess. But <laughs> it's the little things that go a long way allow you to go turkey hunting and deer hunting <laughs> it really is and uh i can say you know even just that that first picture of your stock tank i mean there's a lot of money you can drop into a pool and don't get me wrong you can drop a lot of money into anything but at the uh, at the crux of it, it really is just having a small body of water to lay in or be in and cool off and drink a nice beverage. Like you don't have to have a huge pool, just, you know, something a woman can, or I man, anybody climb in, cool off and, you know, have a good drink. Nobody's gonna be swimming laps. <laughs> you know? Now see, we can take this thing one step further. And we're going to stop talking about this in a second. If you get the right pump, cause you got to put a pump on your stock tank pool to clean the water for you. Right. You know? If you get the right pump, which I've got one, like, I don't know what the horsepower is, and you're in there by yourself, got your little float on there, you can just sit there and do laps. <laughs> it's got it's got some power to it. You just turn the, turn like I got PVC pipes all rigged up. You just turn You ain't the doing laps. You're doing you're lazy like, river at that point. I, actually, I'm just sitting there in the middle doing circles. <laughs> it's just like, eh. it's like going down a toilet. <laughs> so. Uh. Speaking of turkeys, being, though. Yeah, speaking of turkeys, and, and let's, let's actually let's let's do this. Let's talk about uh, your your company that you started, Horny Deer Sense. And, and Horny Deer Sense. The, I mean, the name is horrible. That does it does not fit in whatsoever. I'm not wearing you got a Horny Deer Scent hat right now or anything. You know. You got to get <laughs> yeah. The the hat looks great on you, by the way. Uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, I'll be honest. The uh, so the the product came before the name like you know we've been using the product for a while and kind of locally uh you, you had you really get a 
a lot of word of mouth going. So there was a point where it's like, okay, well, we might have something, you know, we're, we're selling enough, you know, we might, might as well, you know, make a company out of it. So on the back end, you know, we were looking for a name and uh, honestly the horny deer sense, I mean, you, you think about it, but when it hits your mind, you're like, there's no way that that's still available. Not at this point in time, you know? And uh, it was, and we went with it. And, uh, you know, we, to this point, we've only had one store that was a little apprehensive about it. And uh, we're like, I, you know, to each their own, you know, uh, but for the most part, it's a name that you don't forget, but kind of for us growing locally, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with the product. You know, people hear the name Horny Deer Sense and then uh, you got people that actually are trying to product and with all the marketing avenues today, to me, there still is nothing better than word of mouth. And you know, last year was our third season. And between our first season and third season, mainly based on word of mouth, it really has been just incredible to see it take off. And uh, now it's like, can we hold on and, uh, you know, weather next year's storm? <laughs> Well, that's the thing about any business, especially on the, in the infancy stages. Like most all businesses start with an idea, either something that you, you create a better mouse trap, or you find something that nobody else wants to do. Well, right. in, in the hunting industry, it's a really hard to find something that nobody else wants to do or something that somebody hadn't already done. And if it's still out there and thriving, then it's a, it's, it's a, you know, viable business, but if it's not out there and thriving and somebody has tried it, then you probably don't need to do it because it's a bad idea. For sure. Like, like, like turkey scent, you know, things like that. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. Yeah. Um, hey, I'm, I'm not saying thing. turkeys can't smell, but. Well, and you know, and that's what I appreciated about, about you even, even testing it out last year. You know, I had obviously talked to you about it even on, on the podcast and whatnot, but uh, you still wanted to get it in your hands. You still wanted it to put, you still wanted to put it to work, you know? And, uh, I remember last, uh, early last year, I sent you a bottle of D harmony and I remember you tested it out in your backyard and you called me happy as hell. You're like, dude, I just watched the spike in my backyard go crazy for about 45 minutes. I was literally, uh, I had, I, I had a, a bottle of D harmony. I went back there. I made, I think I made two or three mock scrapes around this little food plot, this food plot probably not even a quarter of an acre and uh but it's tucked in the woods nice and they travel through there and so i made some mock scrapes i spread i mean i just doused the bushes all over these things with it and then that spike walked out and he just sat there he kept going laps around that thing he's like looking around like where are they at i know something's here i can't find it but i love this smell and um you know and that, that made me a believer that this thing works and you know we, we've traveled all over the country and we've used it in all these different states and i mean you know We've had crazy experiences, and um, it's just one of those things where I don't believe, you know, as deer hunters especially, we always we're looking for that one hundred percent product. Uh, whether whether it's scent control, whether it's you know a, a bow, a broadhead, what we want something that is one hundred percent. We're going to be successful every time. Yeah. And so when when you find something, and nothing nothing's one hundred percent. I mean, I'm firmly firm believer that that's impossible. For but sure. Every little thing we use, like. Uh, say like we work with ozonics. So if we use an ozonics, we spray down with our lethal and we wash our clothes with lethal and we use horny deer sense, you know, to give us these 10%, 4%, 8%, 20% advantages to get close to that 100%, which that, you know, we can get to 99.9%, .9%, but that 0.1%, that dough is going to get you. That's all there is For sure. Yeah. yeah. Or you're going to do something stupid. You're going uh, I move when I shouldn't move. I mean, whatever. It's human error. Yeah. <clears throat> but with all that being said, you as a as a hunter you you're looking for these products and when you find one and horny deer, deer sense is one of those it's going to increase your odds that's what we're after we're after increasing our odds because yeah zero zero percent is walking out that get getting out of your truck from the office all day or, or whatever and walking into the woods in like what we're wearing right now and i'm not saying you can't kill a deer doing that because people right. do it all the time but if you're hunting that one deer, that that you know, or a handful of 
your shooter but whatever the case is that that's when you start looking for those percentages to increase your odds absolutely well you mentioned you know designing a better mousetrap and for us you know having used really fresh product versus you know store-bought and, and it's not to knock any given product but when you do produce on a mass level and you know you got to figure in logistics so it's not only you know, from procuring the the product, but it also, you know, it goes to distribution companies. It's sitting there for, for Lord knows how long, then it's going to a store shelf and it's sitting there for, you know, a lot of times multiple seasons, like years, right? And so our approach, it really was very simple. It was like, look, you know, let's find, let's find a container because the two, the two biggest factors in keeping a product fresh, uh, urine specifically the two biggest factors are protecting it from light and oxygen so you know we start with the bottle we got a, a glass bottle you know to keep the integrity of the product as a dark amber bottle we've got the spray tops so you don't have to open the top every time exposing it to, to more oxygen and i'm sure you've noticed it goes a lot further when you spray it like in spray form like you know which don't get me wrong, we, we use it very incredibly liberal, you know, <laughs> but it goes so much further than if you're opening a top and, and pouring it out. And that was kind of our better mousetrap, you know, instead of going through these long processes, let's put the product out, you know, just the way nature provides it, you know? So in the, the peak of the rut here in Georgia, here in November, you know, if, uh, if you buy a horny deer scent product in November, odds are you know it, it was it was in the bladder of an animal within a couple of weeks and the i mentioned earlier the word of mouth and you mentioned seeing them do some crazy things when you've not used a truly fresh product and all you have is your experience based on what you've used in the past you know there there's deer that are killed where people might have used this product and maybe not seen the deer react but because they killed the deer like oh it must have worked this leaves zero doubt. The stories that, that come back and the stories that we experience ourselves, you know, like like the spike that you've seen acting crazy, it real, I mean, it, it, it does register on a whole different level. Uh, we've got a gentleman up in, in up in Iowa and uh, our first first season that, you know, we had sold product up there, he, he calls me or sends us a message like, dude, your product works. And at this point, I know what's coming. I'm like, tell me what happened. Let's hear it. <laughs> So he says, you know, it's a rainy day and I've got him recorded. We you know, probably have him uh, put it. I, I want to do a podcast of just people that choose our product with their stories. And I've already recorded his story, uh, but it's raining. You know, he's, he's got his, his scrape that his mock scrape that he's hunting over. He's got a scent wick with our stuff on it and it starts raining. Well, the wick starts dripping into the scrape, right? So he has an eight point buck, big Iowa eight point catch wind of this wick and comes into it when he gets to it he literally and he's telling me the story just right out of his mouth you know he starts scraping the ground with his antlers he said then he lays down and starts rolling in it like a dog <laughs> he said i don't he said i've never seen anything like it in my life he said it was like he just wanted it on him and so he rolls around in it like a dog stands up and he plugs him at 20 yards but when i talk about spreading through word of mouth that's that's why it's like lighting lighting a match in a box of, of other matches you know people are using it they're having these crazy stories they're seeing beyond a shadow of a doubt that this product made a difference in their hunt and you know like you said you can't guarantee everything but i promise you if if a if a rutting white-tailed deer catches wind, I've seen I've seen bucks leave live does, you know, that maybe they were chasing that wasn't, uh, you know, it, it, in the estrus phase quite yet. I've seen them leave live does to to come into the smell. For people that that try, it, I mean, it it is absolutely night and day when you use a fresh product versus an old one. And that's the key. That's that's what people need to understand too, when it when it comes to sense because. There, there was a product years ago that I really was, was a fan of, and I've told you about it in the, in the past. And it worked really well, but when you, you hit the key is freshness. Because you would get that, that first of, these, of the season and go out and use it, and it worked great. But if you tried to use that same attractant the next season from just sitting it up, you could put it in the refrigerator or whatever, 
man, it, it was terrible. Like the right. deer would was would blow at you when they smelled it. While yeah. the same bottle I used a year before, I would have does lined up smelling where I walked in. For and sure. And when you and I started talking with each other, <clears throat> it all came about like I, I was on your podcast, and then we decided to uh, with Backwoods Life as a brand. That's that we've always wanted our uh, unique products, and so then we started talking about developing uh, a scent with you. Yeah, we have the horny deer scent, and so, um, and I guess since it's we we got the trademark now, so we can we can tell everybody what it is, right? <laughs> yeah, we can we can uh, we can talk about it now. We're 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 in the process of developing how we want to go forward with it, but we we're it's going to be called all bucked up. It's going to be nasty. And, and, and <laughs> the bucks are nasty, man. Just rolled in piss. I mean, that's <laughs> see what I'm saying? Like they. They pee on themselves. I mean, they're nasty, so we're, it's well, all bucked up out there. <laughs> the name, the name is so fitting, just because of of the the visible reaction. Like some of the stories that we get, I mean, it really is just insane, you know. And uh, like going back to to using it last year, when you called, just you sounded like a fifteen year old kid excited about something again, you know, like you were you were just happy as hell to, to see something do what it was supposed to do. Just don't say giddy. Don't say that. I know that's your favorite word. I don't love the giddy. word giddy. I let, I, I was tell, not giddy. You know, I, I don't, it's been a while back, but Mike said something. We were excited about something. It might've been something around all bucked up or something. Uh, it, anyway, I sent him back something telling him I, I was plum giddy about it. And, uh, <laughs> Let me tell you something about Mike Lee. Once he gets something on you, there's no, there's no statute of limitations. It will, it will come back up. So now, now, now I'm Mr. Giddy, but I'm okay with it. Well, that's the thing. I, I'm a firm believer. If, if I, if I don't pick on you, I don't like you. I'm not to the point like I'm going to bully you about something, but you're going to have your one little thing. That I'm like, that's, that's my Giddy guy over here. You know? He will pick on you, and then around Valentine's, he'll tell you to let your wife know he just got busy and, you know, he didn't mean to forget about it. Type, type <laughs> thing. Well, you're the one who called me on Valentine's Day first. <laughs> oh, Lord. No, well, I'm, I'm really incredibly excited, uh, you know, and I've watched you guys for years, and, uh, you know, we've got a, a mutual buddy that kind of, you know, bridged that gap with us, but uh to to be working and i think you know just sharing so many views as far as like how you view the sport of hunting and uh you know feeling the same way about so many things and you know i had a thought the other day you know, we were talking about uh hunters shaming other hunters you know and uh how how big of a pain it is i i really hate seeing anybody post a picture of a deer and saying he's not the biggest but you know, he's not my biggest deer, mm. but s s stop that crap. Tell me you're happy as hell about what just transpired. You know, like I, I want to see that part, but I was thinking about it in the best way that I can relate it is to the game of golf, believe it or not. Okay. You ready for this? So the game of golf, right? You have people that play the game of golf that will never break a hundred that play their whole damn life and love the hell out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you have people that pick up the game and they start getting better and see progress and they strive towards scratch and they're, they're taking something completely different away from the game, but everybody is taking away something like the guy that shoots over a hundred that plays with the same four guys every weekend that's out there, you know, just for beers and cigars, he's never going to throw up a score. He knows it. You know, it to me, it, there really is no difference in the maturation process of a hunter. Like some golfers start out bad and get better, much like hunters. Some golfers start out bad and they're very comfortable staying there. Plus, you know, God only gave them so much athletic ability. You know, <laughs> if you told them they had to break a hundred to keep playing the game of golf, that would not be good for the sport, right? So hunting to me is exactly the same way. People are going to take different things away from the sport. You know, the guy that is, you know, out there with his buddies, not giving a, a damn about what he plays, he has taken away something. And some could argue more valuable as far as the experience than the guy that's out there getting pissed at every bad shot that he makes. And, and that's a really good analogy. I've never thought of it that way. 
and it's so accurate because what what keeps a lot of people playing golf is when they hit one good shot. Absolutely. You, you hit you hit and one they, good shot. Boom. And you're like, man, that that's you know, and and that and that makes a lot of people like myself because I, I played golf for years and years and years now, I hardly ever play. But I mean, I, I would I would get out there and, and I was going to beat the course. Like that's my goal. I'm 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 com- I'm not competitive where I'm, I'm in a bad way. I'm competitive with myself, so I'm yeah. hard on myself. You know, I'm not me and you go out and play golf and you you beat me by thirty strokes. I'm like man, I'm <laughs> great job, man. You know? Right, right. But but uh, but if I'm out there, I'm I'm not competing with you. I'm competing with me. And the same thing with hunting. I'm not competing with you. I'm competing with me. I'm, right. I'm trying to satisfy my goals or whatever. Absolutely. But you're exactly right. I mean, you know, you got a guy out there that shoots 105 and then the guy with him shoots a 79 man i had a bad day i shot a 79 that was terrible and then the yeah. guy just hoping he on his best day he's 101 you know and like just like you said so you don't need to I mean, you need to be sent be i won't say sensitive because that's not a good term but you need to be aware of other people's limitations so absolutely so if i'm hunting here in georgia and you, and you, you can relate go shoot 120 inch deer 120 inch eight points it's a really nice buck Feel good about it, right? But if I'm, you know, me, me and Lee Lakoski are hunting together in Iowa at 120 walk sites, you, you're not even thinking. You're not. Well, there's a baby. Right. Okay, cool. That's a, that's a baby. I mean, I'm not worried about it. And you, but you know, we reverse the roles. Lee comes down here in that 120 walk site. He's like, oh, man, I'm not shooting that deer. I'm like, well, you probably won't shoot one then, buddy. You know? Yeah. That that's it's all relevant to to where you're hunting, to how you're hunting, and what you your own personal goal. So, like you said, the guy that goes out there and shoots 100. Has a good time with his buddies. He knows he's going to shoot 100. He doesn't care. He's just there to have fun and enjoy Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Just like the guy that goes out there, shoots a six point, four point, ten point, whatever the hell he wants to, having a good time. He's there with his buddies, his family, whatever, enjoying hunting. Who, like you said, don't, don't say, well, this ain't the biggest buck in the world. Who cares? Like, I shot this deer. Like, yeah. If you go hunting, turkey hunt, open day of the season, and a Jake comes in there and showing out and you gas him, who cares? They all look Absolutely. the same in a frying pan. Well, on the big picture, we we can't talk about the number of hunters uh, you know shrinking every year, and then I and then blast somebody that and, and that's the thing too. You know, there are there are a lot of adults that that get into hunting that don't start out hunting. You know, and the thought of somebody posting a picture of their first buck and you know just the everybody knows how fulfilling that can be. You know, it, particularly if you're just starting something and, you know, you post a picture of that first book and you're happy as hell and then people start shitting on you. Dude, that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that is not good for the sport. You know, when, when Tiger Woods, you know, burst into the scene in the in the PGA, the, the sport grew immensely and still experiences the effect of him playing the game. There were a lot of new golfers on the golf course. I'm sure there were a lot of frustrated golfers, you know, that that didn't like these newcomers, right? Mm-hmm. You know, these are these, these are people. Hey, you should be on a driving range. What are you doing out here on a golf course? You know, mm-hmm. but the sport benefited. The sport grew, and a lot of those golfers that started out then, they're they're much better now. But even if they're not, as long as they're still, you know, contributing to the game as a whole, you know, how can you be mad about that? Well, it's just a prime example. So if, if you're going to be that, that guy, then when you go play golf, you need to use the old persimmon head wood clubs. <laughs> yeah. You know, if, if you're going to yeah. bust at me for using a, an elite bow and, and oh, you're, you're, you're not using a, a recurve traditional or not, or, or, well, you, are you, you hunt with a flint lock too? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you, you're still yeah. using that, that brown and bar from 1983 with a 93 pound trigger pull. I mean, exactly. Technology has advanced sports, period. For I don't sure. Care what sports you look at, look at, look at, baseball, and have helped the sport. All of it. Look at the athletes. And I'm not saying all hunters are athletes, but, you know, if it's a sport and you're a participant, you're considered an athlete, right? If you're a player. For sure. So, um, and that's a good point. If you had to hunt with the recurve today, there would be a lot less bow hunters out there. There'd be a lot lot more deer, though. <laughs> There'd be a lot more deer. <laughs> We'd have deer everywhere. We, had, but, we would have but, deer everywhere. And, and, but that's the thing. I mean, <laughs> you, if you, you know, there, there's always that guy or that girl in some cases. Because I had, I had one argue with, one argue with me the other day. I don't argue back with them. I'm just like, hey, thanks for your opinion. Have a good one. Every once in a while, I, I chime in some educational statistics. Like, hey, uh, like I put up my hog trap. You know, and hogs are a bad nuisance here, especially yeah. in South Georgia. 
And I put my hog trap up, and this lady's like, oh, I grew up on a farm. You don't have to trap hogs to kill them. You're some murderer. You know, all this kind of, I'm like, wow. Have you ever yeah. been to my part of this world and seen what these damn things do? No. So right. shut up. These are not tame hogs that you can go rattle a feed bucket and they come into. They're wilder. They're harder to kill than the freaking deer we got. Oh, but they're yeah, not you're gonna, But you're going to judge me because I'm trying to get rid of an invasive nuisance species that do millions of dollars in crop destruction and, and land For destruction sure. and tractor destruction. Cause I, I got a notification, something about my AirPods again. What is this thing doing? Welcome to live freaking podcasting. So I probably can't hear you for a second right now. Let me, let me redo this. I did, this happened to me. I was interviewing uh, Larry McCoy or Chad Bendit. Yep. I'm reconnecting. Can you hear me yep, now? I'm reconnecting. Oh, I can hear you. Yep, there we go. That's all I had to do today. I'm, I'm finna throw these in the trash. These are like AirPod negative ones. That's so anyway, but back to people bashing. <laughs> to your point though, so when you mentioned being on a golf course, and even if you play with somebody scratch or somebody good, like it's you versus the golf course, right? Right. That's you looking inwardly. What do you need to get something out of? You know, because let's face it, you're spending your time, our most valuable asset doing this, right? Mm -hmm. Life in general, not only hunting, but life in general, you, you know, especially with all the, the woke garbage and everything going on today, you could stop the world's problems immediately if everybody would look inwardly at themselves and fix what's there instead of being worried about what the hell anybody else is doing. Bottom line. I rest my case. The, that's the, this that's has the been good, Maga. It was yeah. good to catch up. We'll catch you. You, you had to come do the, the Horny Deer Scent podcast again soon. <laughs> well, but you hit the nail on the head, man. It's it's. Don't worry about what other people are doing unless it is affecting you personally. Like yeah. they're they're trespassing on your property. They're stealing from you. They're you know they're doing something like that. Exactly. Who cares, man? Just let if they're not breaking any laws and not you know doing anything to harm you or your family or friends. And if you have time to sit and nitpick on everybody else, you're not doing enough to challenge yourself. Exactly. I mean, you need a hobby. You need to yeah, start you need whittling, to do whittling something. arrowheads or something. Crap. That'll keep you busy for a long time. That's the Indians. <laughs> you know, that's, <clears throat> that's, that's my point is, is people and, and social media. And that's, that's one thing I do want to want to talk to you about with, with, as far as 20 deer sense goes is social media is a, is a, is a necessary evil, but it is the, the quote part of that is evil. Like yes. that's where I think a lot of, and I've, I've said this before to different people. That's where a lot of the bad things in this world come to surfaces on social media, because you, you, it gives people an outlet to basically bash other people like we're talking about, to argue with other people, disagree. And I'm, I'm okay with disagreeing, yeah. if you, but the part of disagreeing, like if you and I, we, if we disagree on like, Turkey hunting, for example, like you don't believe in going, you know, finding one. I, I'm not saying you, you don't believe this, but like, yeah, yeah. you don't believe, you believe in going and sitting on a food plot and trying to call one in where I'm more, let's go get them. Let's go get under the roost tree and try to get on the pitch down or whatever. Like that's just a disagreement on technique and, and right. thought process or, or, and, and we can, and if you want to get into the, like, you know, religious beliefs or whatever, people can agree to disagree and still have intelligent conversations with each other. For Social sure. media is bringing out who's in the bottom of the dumpsters. That, uh, that's what happens there. People that just, they're so miserable with their lives, they want to bring down others and they want to just be those kind of people. But we'll leave that part of this out. I want you to show, because cause Horny Deer Sense is a prime example of how you can grow a business on social media and, yeah. and be successful. <laughs> so in... You know, and I take away a lot from our conversations too, uh, just from the the things that you know you you talk about as far as maintaining a level of consistency, which I've I've I'll be honest to this point in the year I've I've slacked a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, last season, uh, kind of the the dam broke for us a little bit in a good way, but it was just it was a it did not feel like feel like hunting season uh it, we were just so incredibly busy which we're thankful for it um but at the same time when 
when you do have that level of consistency that you talk about, you know, people, they're getting to know you as an individual. And it's not like back in the day where there was kind of like a, like a curtain between, you know, the consumer and, you know, the business, like today, everything is just out there in your face. Like even, even from a celebrity standpoint, like the Oscars and what nobody gives a, a crap about Oscars or anything like that anymore because they have the access to those stars that they want, you know, the the mystique so to speak has dropped a little bit but for people like us it, it works out really really well because we are the people that are con not only consuming our our you know like your show or our products like we are those people you know so very incredibly relatable for us what the best way that it has impacted us is being able to show like the success that people were having with our products and you know people they're so excited to send us pictures and tell us the stories because they're hearing from their friends and they're seeing uh pictures that we post on horny deer scent and just reading the stories that we put out you know people giving their account and so what happens is it just kind of takes on a, a bit of a snowball effect, you know, in this past season, the majority of our content was just posting pictures of using our stuff. And uh, they made my job incredibly easy, but, you know, on the, the flip side of that, to be, to be exposed, uh, you know, there's a, a gentleman in Iowa who's his little brother it has like, like a health problem. And, uh, you know, they went out this fall and like his whole family, you know, is, is sending us message and, you know, the kids so happy and just everything that goes into it. But I think the secret sauce is that reciprocity, you know, like not only are they consuming, you know, our product, but we're, we're genuinely excited to be a part of these stories, these memories, you know, when a kid, they send a picture of his first deer and, you know, you know that your product not only not only played a part in that that first deer success they're sending you pictures and it's like these are the pictures if if horny deer sense were to disappear tomorrow there will be pictures in in you know decades from now where people are pictured with their first deer holding a bottle of our product and that's i mean it that is beyond anything that I envisioned with any of this. Like I get, I get so much from that, you know, if horny deer sense continues to grow and we believe it will, uh, yeah, it's a phenomenal product. I would love for everybody to try it. That's not, but even if it didn't just the, the relationships that we've built to this point, it was so much more than I anticipated when we first started. But I think, I think that's it. You, you just gotta one, be consistent be true to yourself. But at the same time, you know, there's no longer that separation like there used to be, you know, between companies and consumers. We're, we're kind of all in this together, so to speak. Exactly. And that's the thing. There's, you know, two things I want to add to that <clears throat> is number one, proof of concept. That, yes. That's exactly what proof of performance, proof, proof of concept is what is what people I think on a social media level like to see. So if you're sitting there and, and on your Instagram or Facebook on Horny Deer Sense and you, you're just posting pictures every day of people, you know, taking deer, tagging deer, gripping grins, holding a bottle, showing your deer like, hey, I, I legitimately use this product. I'm not just sending you some BS. Like I've got a little testimony, I sprayed this, this deer rolled in it, I shot it, you know, things exactly. like that on a consistent basis that's going to attract consumers to go, man, I need to try this stuff out. I mean, if you yeah. just, just like, just like, you know, broadheads, for example, we shoot slick trick broadheads and the, you know, we're shooting deer and like you're showing, man, look at this entrance hole, look at this exit hole. This deer didn't go 50 yards and people are going to say, well, you know what? I got to try that. You know, right. I got, I got, and that's, and that's what we're looking for. It goes back to those, those percentages, but you also don't want to be the, the 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 social media guy that posts one picture in the whole month of November of a, of a deer. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, this congratulations, Chris, you killed a great buck using horny deer sense. That's the only picture you got the whole month of November. Right. For example, like that. Okay, that's not going to move product. You know. Yeah. And and me me working with lethal products like I do, that's something I thoroughly believe in. Now, and some people think. You know, I'm, I, you work with these different people, and, and so like you get like the Horny Deer Scent Pro Staff, for example. And, and anybody listening, this go to hornydeersense.com and go to the Pro Staff and apply, and, and check it out. It's, it's an awesome little program that Scott's put together. Um, 
get you a little discount on the products and, and you can see how these things work. And, but with that being said, you know, you may, you may give people some product, you know, discounts or whatever like that. You're not buying them. Like well, I had one guy says, well, I don't like to do those kind of pictures because I don't, I don't want to whore it out. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, I get that, but at the same time, show people that it works. Now, if that's well, just, that was know, our, Go, the brunt ahead. of our motivation, yeah, that was the brunt of our motivation in doing that. So our first season, uh, we literally made our first Instagram post in June of 2019, and the 2019 season was our first, technically our first season. We sold, you know, we sold a lot locally where people were familiar with our product, but on a national scale, they st they still weren't. So that first season, it was a bit of a struggle. You know, we were mostly documenting our own experiences, our, our own hunting. But as the as the notoriety grew and word of mouth grew, people started using our product. Well, fast forward to this past year, you know, and a big part of it was the pro staff program. And so people, you know, they look at pro staff and some people think, oh, this means I'm a professional hunter. You know, it means <laughs> promotional staff, right? Yep. And and it, we're not, we don't look for people that, that kill huge deer constantly all the time. Again, like we, we're incredibly relatable because we are hunting mostly the same types of property. You know, we might have a lease every now and then, or, you know, some permission to hunt somewhere locally or, uh, but there's a lot of public land. I mean, we're, we're not out there slaying one fifties on a regular basis. Like we are our consumer, you know, and even even the pro staff guys, there were there were a lot of people that signed up for that program that we knew damn well they weren't that scratch golfer out there <laughs> you know we knew that but you know what a lot of those people that you know maybe aren't that the equivalent of what you know a scratch golfer would be in the hunting world as far as killing huge deer they're some of the best stories came from those people that have struggled day in day out season after season have tried product after product dude i've seen so many people grinning ear to ear with a you know six seven eight point buck just you know just a memory etched in their mind but it's totally different than somebody killing a, a 160 and you know they're all mean mugging like yeah yeah look at this <laughs> You see these people, the major, and that's the thing. The, they're the major, the majority of the hunters out there. You know, that is the majority of the people that make up this sport. And you know, that part it was incredibly rewarding because they're not out there trying. They might not. And here's you can't kill a 160 if there's not a 160 on your property. You know, and, and some some chunks of land will never produce a 160. And so a lot of these people, they're, they're hunting the deer that they're, they're able to hunt in the time that they're able to hunt it. And those smiles, they're so much more genuine than somebody that's killed their 20th huge deer. You know, like, I don't know. That's who we're doing it for. And that's the thing. I mean, don't get me wrong, man. I'm, I'm sitting here looking around my office and I mean, I, I've killed some giants all over the country. And I don't want to hear about it. Been, been... <laughs> Well, then don't ever come to my house. No. <laughs> I what? No. Nah. No. no. I, it, I, so I mean, he says what? that, but multiple times we've, we've been connected in this video format. And uh, he's not shy about changing his camera camera angle so I can see his wall. But go if, on, you watch, if, if you watch the videos in this podcast, this is the view you're going to get. That's as simple as that. You can see some turkeys, a 110 inch, 20 inch Texas buck right here, a little silhouette shot. That was a good deer right there of me. And you don't even know if that's me. I could have stole that thing off of the internet. That is a <laughs> badass. And and here's the thing too, though. I love people challenging themselves, you know, again, going into the maturation process of a hunter. I love somebody, you know, starting the sport and doing some things and learning and harvesting a good deer and then thinking, you know what, I want to do better next time. And you start letting deer walk and start, you know, doing things to manage their property. I love seeing the maturation process that a hunter goes through when he's locked in like that. Absolutely love it. And you know what? They benefit just as much from the product as the person that's just starting. But there was a guy this last Halloween, one of the coolest stories that I've experienced. My brother, he lives down in Woodstock, Georgia. And 
it was Halloween and a, a husband, um, he's probably, he may be, I don't know, early thirties, a uh, husband, wife, and a small child show up at my brother's door. And a guy had, uh, something hunting related on and, you know, him and my brother start talking Well, the guy had just literally started, uh, trying to learn how to deer hunt. And he and my brother start talking. And so my brother, you know, he can, he can see that this guy, he's not had that person in his life to really put him on the path that he needs to be on. Right. So he started spending some time with him. The, the guy takes him to where he's been hunting and no, and he literally had just a, a chair sitting out in the middle of the woods where he would go sit and wait in hopes of shooting a deer. Right. So my brother hooks him up with a blind. He, he had a trail cam. There's this, you know, seven point buck that he'd been watching and he just could not, you know, get close enough to this buck to make it happen. Right. My brother hooks him up with a bottle of horny deer sense. Right gets him in a blind, takes him out there. And he, I'll, I'll show that he's on our, our web or, uh, our Instagram page from this last year. He's one of the pictures that we posted. Dude kills his first buck, a seven point buck. And like, he's calling my brother, like almost in tears. Like it was just one of those moments. One of the coolest things. And when I think about somebody shitting on somebody for their first buck, this is the guy that I think about hearing his story and the emotions that were wrapped up with it it literally hurts my heart to think that somebody could see him post a picture of that and then talk about how he should have let it walk or oh uh, that'd been nice in a couple of years like, keep that shit to yourself you know what i mean well and, and that's and you hit the nail on the head i mean and that's the thing growing up uh I, you know i hunted with my dad and my uncles and my grandfathers and everything so much and <clears throat> you know i remember shooting my first buck he's actually a little antler mount on the wall right around the corner um, but with all that being said, I remember how excited I was that morning. I shot that deer. My grandfather was there with him. I think my dad was actually off fishing somewhere, but you know, those are things you can never get back. Like you, right. you know, those moments are, you know, they, they influence you to the point of a, a, a high, you know, I want to keep doing this. I want to keep doing that. And every, every one of these deer I've shot, I can tell you every story about every one of them. I had a guy in here working on my, um, my, air conditioner in my, my office here and he's a good buddy of mine and every time he comes in here he's looking at my deer and stuff man that's my favorite next time he goes, oh that's my favorite and i'm like they're all my favorite like i, I, yeah. I appreciate every one of them but he's like man you remember all i'm like yeah just pick one out and he'll pick one out i said okay i shot that one here with this on that day i mean i took, can take you the whole hunt and i hope that my memory stays sharp enough the rest of my life that i can at least yeah. tell you all that much might not remember my name but i can remember where that deer was killed but for years it was where i myself uh i was hunting with my dad and my, and my family like that and so we were all doing the work together we were all putting stands up together making food plots together blah blah blah. and i never felt like like i, I was i was happy with what i shot but i always felt like i i, I didn't do it myself like my, yeah. my dad led me down so many success paths in, in life of, of hunting that i was like well you know my dad is proud of me don't get me wrong man he, he enjoys it as much as anybody on this planet but he he like he he let you come down. He wants you to come to the farm. He wants you to shoot a deer. That that's just kind of guy he is. He want he wants you know right. people to come and enjoy <laughs> what he's prepared. Well well me, I I love that and I love going and sitting in the blind with him and you know deer stands whatever and and enjoying what what we've kind of done together and what he's done. But when I got my own land to hunt, like I, there, yeah. my, uh, there's a gun cabinet right here. You can't see much of it on the video that my dad actually built, and I and and he didn't want it anymore, so I refinished it and 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 I keep it here and with, with some shotguns in it and stuff. But there's a turkey fan in that gun cabinet right there. That's the first turkey I killed on a lease that I could afford to do by myself. I, I created the environment. I called that turkey in and I killed it. It wasn't That's on somebody awesome. else's property. It wasn't on. It wasn't even on my family property. It was. It was me, one hundred percent me. And that's an accomplishment to me because I started from scratch on that dirt. And I mean, there were turkeys there, but I I made that guy come get shot there. Not right. I'm, I'm hunting somebody else's bird. Same thing with with um, hunting leases, like deer lease. Um, I've only, I mean, I had some here close to home, but I never killed a deer on. Them. They were terrible. Like I was just got them because they were close to the house you know just just yeah. to have somewhere to hunt that i wasn't traveling like when i'm sitting at home and my family farms like an hour away it's not that far but it's it's hard to get up go hunting up there drive an hour go hunt then drive an hour back and and keep up with work to make sure. it's just it's tough um so 
when we got our lease over uh, a little bit further east over here in Georgia, I, I, I'm trying to remember exactly, but I think that was one of the first bucks that I killed that I, I did. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I did all the work, but I mean, we had help, but like I found the land, we did the work, we put up the stands, I fed these deer, I made, right. I made them come out there. I mean, that that's just what happened. And to hit what you said, that guy experienced when he killed that seven point, you put in all the work and do all of that. I don't give a damn if he's a spike or a 200 inch deer. Absolutely. You earned that one. Period. For sure. That, yeah. Now, and that, <clears throat> that's a great point. You know, you can only, you can only kill what you have access to hunt. I mean, bottom line, you can be the best hunter in the world, but if you've got 200 acres that only has, uh, you know, a, a 130 on it, that will be, unless a deer comes from a, a neighboring property during the rut, there is the top of your expectation right there. I mean, and then, then you factor in the individual that, you know, works constantly, you know, doing whatever, and then has a little bit of time to go slip into the woods every once in a while. Maybe, you know, he's padding the freezer. Maybe, you know, he don't even really care about a rack. Like his trophy is meat in the freezer for this fall. Like, tell me, tell me that man can't be excited about what just happened. He, he's putting meat on the table. Like, why can't he enjoy it? Well, I think the problem is, yeah, remember growing up, I mean, you both were, were close to the same age, if not the same age. Um, You're definitely up, older. Yeah, I know. Look on it. Great. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, but I remember um, growing up, like, I mean, you didn't have cell phones. I, mean, I know a lot of people that might listen to this are like, what? You're really yeah. old if you didn't have a cell phone. I mean, <laughs> yeah. but it's before they were invented. Um, so, when you shot a deer, there wasn't a, I mean, now the deer, like you, the, the shot just went off and people are already posting it on Instagram, you know, like the echo yeah. hasn't gone through the woods from the rifle yet. Oh, right. Down, you know what I mean? And, and that's fine. But back then it was like, nobody saw your deer. No, I mean, you, you, you had some eight by tens in your pocket or something or in your truck that you, oh yeah, here's yeah. a picture of my deer I killed. Or you like, <laughs> right. we did, you hauled around the rack forever if you're going to get it mounted until the taxidermist called sure. and said, hey, it's your turn. Then you, then you, you know, you kept that rack at home. Um, Back in the day, it used to be, I heard some guy killed a nice 10 right. over in Murray County. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It's supposed to be nice. That, <laughs> that was it. And now that same deer is on seven, 17 different states. <laughs> by dark oh this is ohio <laughs> illinois yeah. kansas he shot it with a with a slingshot or a spear yeah. and a, a whatever i mean like that this this just so crazy now i think and and that's the thing there are positives and negatives from the social media i seen a, a graph the other day to where and it, it really did coincide perfectly with social media uh, as far as when social media started really getting big but kind of since that time period when all that started and it didn't attach it to that, but I mean, you can kind of see it, but since that time period, the average age of deer or bucks that have been taken, the average age is actually growing up. So there there's positives, you know, cause people are seeing the effects that can happen when you do manage a deer herd, you know, uh, my buddy, Bruce Swearage and forest wildlife, they put out some phenomenal products that, you know, right now, this time of year through spring, you will see a difference in your herd come fall. So there's an educational process. The average number of age has gone up with bucks. You know, people are killing older, mature deer, and that's that's great. But I also wonder on the flip side, as far as the, the, the number of hunters, uh, just in general that are seeing these types of deer and just feeling like there's no point in them doing it. Like it, it's kind of, yeah. I can see where it could take away from what they're trying to get out of the sport where it's like, what, what am I even doing? Like, this is never going to happen for me. So, yeah. so much of it is in the framing. Like I love seeing the progress as far as people taking older deer, healthier deer, but there needs to be uh, there needs to be something you know just as much on the flip side bringing you know grown men grown women people that didn't start out hunting but making it feel like an environment to where they can come into it pretty seamlessly and grow 
You know, again, going back to golf, you pick up the game of golf at 30. I mean, you're going to suck at 30, <laughs> you, you know, but hopefully that person gets better, but there should be, you know, we should just all reserve those initial instincts you know, of, you know, trying to procure some level of self-righteousness. I, I wouldn't have shot that deer. I'd let nobody gives a shit what you would have done. This man did it <laughs> and he enjoyed up. the hell out of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, just sit there and be quiet. If they yeah. don't have nothing nice to say, then shut the hell up and be quiet. Don't don't worry. Absolutely. About it. And, and and you know, and we can talk. We get, we need to probably have another podcast closer to deer season. I really do want to talk about like the products themselves and and when to yeah. use them. I know this time of year, probably, not a lot of people are probably thinking about deer hunting, but I want to at least do hop on here together and make an introduction to people to start checking out horny deer season. So in this summer, they can go get that order in so they get that fresh bottle you know for sure there's gonna, there's gonna be a waiting line i believe this year you're gonna have to well like the we're, dmv office. we're doing the we're doing the backwoods life podcast maybe we can get back on the horny deer scent podcast in the summer and you know get into some detail as far as products and i would like so one thing that i did want to touch on as far as in and around our product so a lot of people and it, it kind of like you know hunting a property if, if the biggest deer that you've got is 130, you're not going to kill it 140. Same thing with any type of attractant. If there's not a deer to smell it, you're not going to see that deer. You know, Unless you use horny deer sense, they come in from <laughs> other states. You might have an Iowa deer in Georgia if you use it. <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but you know, but there are also different ways of using attractants just because you know you don't have to use it the same the same day time that you harvest a deer to know that it works there's a gentleman up in illinois this past year that killed a free-ranging uh yeah free-ranging 195 up in illinois this year absolute freak of a deer and he told me when it happened he said you know this deer he's shown up he has a you know great history with a deer um I can't remember rack factor outdoors. If you're on YouTube, you can pull up their channel and see this deer phenomenal. But he said previous years, this deer would show up, but it was all always later in the season. And he said this past year, cause I asked him point blank, like, you know, do you feel like horny deer scent played, you know, a, a part in this, you know, had him on a podcast, one of our last episodes. And what he did, he said, you know, he started very early in mock scrapes. And then when he started seeing the scrapes appear and he said, as a result, this deer showed up way earlier in the season on their property than he normally would. And not only did he show up as long as he kept doctoring the scrapes and, you know, this, this huge deer thinking that another bucks in his territory and there, there's a hot doe in his territory, he stayed locked in in his area and he ended up shooting this deer, you know, he, he pulled in to go hunting and saw the deer in the field uh, before daylight and ended up, you know, at some point getting a shot. So it wasn't like he put it out and the deer came into the product and he shot it, but using the product, you know, through, through the early season up into the point, he absolutely was 100% sure that it's what brought him in and kept him in on that property to give him the opportunity to take the deer. So there's there's more ways to use an attractant like this as opposed to just putting it on a wick and hoping something catches the trail and comes into you. Exactly, you condition that environment for that buck to show up sooner than later. Yes, and and that's a that's another that's a key thing that I do think that a lot of people don't understand. <clears throat> and you know, if, if you're the weekend warrior, and I get it, you know, you just go to hunting when you can. It goes back to using these tools for that percentage of advantage. And even if you're just going into this one stand that you hunt every Saturday morning, if you're doctoring up when you're in there, that's how deer do. They don't. They right. may not be in there every day. That buck may be there one day a week, but he's going to come through there and he's going to check that spot. So that's what you're doing. You're conditioning that resident buck to say, oh, that guy's been here. Exactly. And, and, and your paths may collide. The, the, the likelihood is greater because then that one buck that you're in his territory, he's going to be checking that more frequent to say, see if that other guy has been in there. For sure. You know, if you if you walk in your house and I'm laying on your couch and you didn't know I was coming, you're like, hey, man, what you doing here? <laughs> yeah. Kind of same principle there, you know. <laughs> you peed on my rug. <laughs> well, well, just that one time, man. It wasn't, it wasn't on purpose. It just, I got excited to see you. <laughs> 
but and but there again you know and going back to the whole golf thing and when i thought of it i was like holy shit why have i not thought about this so even even like a, a scratch golfer when he sees somebody starting out you know and don't get me wrong i don't like people that like offering advice that's not solicited you know if i'm not asking you for advice I ain't, I'm, if you tell me i'm probably not gonna listen anyway <laughs> but there are that's why you didn't kill any deer damn it you didn't listen to me <laughs> hey I, my ego wouldn't let me <laughs> But just like a like a beginning golfer, you know, there are there are things that, that they take away from the people that you know have spent much more time crafting what they do, you know, the crafting the art of whatever they do. Uh, but even like like hunting with an attractant, you know, and that's one of the things that we like about the spray bottles. I can't tell you how many deer have come right to my stand just by spraying in, you know, with the wind and have deer come literally straight downwind and stop at the tree. And, uh, you know, there's just so many ways to use it. Obviously, you know, dragging a, a scent trail. Couldn't tell you how many people contacted this year where a deer followed them straight to their tree. My cousin, funny enough, <laughs> he watched the deer pick up his trail and head back to his truck. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be able, don't start your trail at your truck. Start where you can see it. That's the tip of the day for that, morning deer sense. That's a true story. That's a true story. But <laughs> what I'm trying to say is there are a number of ways to be successful. And, uh, you know, but bottom line, it's just like anything. The more you do it, the better you will get. And at the end of the day, you got to cut off YouTube and you got to go out there and start trying stuff. So I should title this podcast, Horny Deer Sense. The more you do it, the better you get. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Deal. That's what it is. That's what we're going to call it. <laughs> i tell you what, though. Like, I love deer hunting, but uh, I got into turkey hunting about five years ago. This is my, my fifth season. And uh, I'm really kicking myself for not starting that earlier. I'm, well, this uh, a, this, dude, uh, not, not to I'm eat up with it. This, this is my 23rd turkey season. Oh. Uh, uh, March, I got, think I first, my first one was like March 21st, something like that, going down to Florida. And um, I, I, I don't know what it is. Until I kill that first turkey every season, I'm stressed out. Yeah, but after the, I know after, what you the, mean. after the icebreaker, deer, deer's kind of the same way too. But, but yeah. to, with, with me, I'm one of them. It's kind of like, like when I used to play baseball. If I got that first hit, the rest just come. Oh, I exactly, I yeah. I don't press. I don't press so hard. Um but one thing I like about turkey hunting is, one, they don't do crap at night, so they're gonna be there somewhere in the right. daytime. <laughs> and um, but I, I, I feels like when when you're turkey hunting, you got two choices: you can make things happen or let things happen. When deer hunting, you try to make things happen, but you're less likely to make things happen. You just make right. the environment to let things happen in deer hunting. For sure. And turkey hunting, if it's noon and you just want to go out there and try to shoot one in the face, go. Like, like you, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's just go get one. You know, let's go find one that wants to die right now. You know, and yeah. and, it, and it's it's subjective. And you know, especially down here where we hunt in Georgia, they're they're not cooperative like they are in some of the other places. But I, I love hunting South Texas. There's no secret. And if anybody keeps up with me at all, I love South Texas. And that's the one of the states for turkeys that I feel like. Like right now, if we're sitting there, like hey, you want you want to go shoot a turkey? It's turkey season. Let's, yeah, we can go have one dead in an hour. You know what I mean? It's just <laughs> yeah. it's just those kind of places are what make me keep turkey hunting. Like I can uh, hunt in Georgia, and I can grind out because you know Georgia jacked us down to two birds now. Right. Um, I I feel like I, I I'm not I don't I'm not want to come off overconfident, but I feel like if it was legal, I could shoot two turkeys open day at turkey season. Yeah, yeah. Just, well, just because I've done my homework, I know kind of where they're at, and I can go get in the ball game, you know. Yeah, and that's nice too, you know, because like deer hunting, and you you approach deer hunting differently on different tracks of land. So you know, if you're public, you, you know, and you're somewhere for you know just a window of time, you can get more aggressive. Whereas you know, if you're hunting your own property that you've worked all year long, you especially early early on, your main focus obviously you're dying and itching to hunt, but in the back of your mind you're like, just don't let me booger it up before the rut exactly. hits, right? Exactly. Whereas a turkey, 
you know, you can mess up on him in the morning and kill him in the afternoon. And, uh, you know, the, the level of forgiveness from that standpoint, but there's also, you know, a lot of things about turkey hunting that, that will make you a better deer hunter, you know? Patience. And, uh, <laughs> dude, I'm telling you, I'm, and part of it too is, you know, during turkey season, we're not having to bottle any piss or anything like that. So <laughs> yeah, I get to go, I get to go hunting, you know? And, uh, but just, just the whole, you know, the first three years, I didn't, I didn't kill anything. And I'll be honest at one point, I didn't really care for turkey hunting. It was, it was more just me being stubborn and, you know, like I'm not going to quit before killing a turkey. Then you kind of, again, going into the maturation process of any type of hunter, the more you do it and the, the more that you can spend time with people that have done it and do it consistently and, you know, learn from them and, Next thing you know, you know, I'm sitting here, just got back from NWTF and uh, I, I'm looking at the calendar. I'm like, for the love of God, get here, April. I'm going crazy. Well, I'll put it this way. Like the, the, the thing with turkey hunting is, and my dad, my dad said this years ago, and I, I understood it then, but I really understand it now. Like, especially you got your own property, you know, you're managing your own you know, flock of turkeys or whatever, you want, whatever they're called. Um, <clears throat> I wish I could call one in, shoot him, take a picture, and then turn him back loose again, do it over again. As much as I yes. like to eat them, I, I, the, the, the call of one in, he comes in, gobbles, struts, does his thing, does exactly what makes us get up and go. Right. I, I just wish I could be like, all right, cool, man, here he is. Look at him. He's, look at these spurs. Look at this beard. All right. There you go, buddy. Go back and let's let's do it again. I, I mean, I guess you could call him in and not shoot him, but I'm telling you, if you do that a couple of times, you're never gonna call that turkey in again. Like, they they yeah. get real smart real quick. But one thing you did say I did like: <clears throat> you go up there in the morning and you got one roosted. Most time, roosted is roasted. That's what a lot of people say if they do fly down and do textbook stuff. But say something happens and you don't get him, you moved, or you know he comes in didn't like your decoys, or you know whatever the case may be, and he leaves. You may not kill him that day, but you're going to get another shot at him. Right. Because he, he, he's in that area for a reason. That's where he lives. That's where he roosts. And another thing that people don't realize, too, if you got a, a good piece of dirt that's got a lot of gobblers on it, there's going to be one. Like, you hear, they get going to start gobbling. And then there's going to one, especially the Easterns. Now, Easterns, one will fire off, and the rest of you hear crickets chirping. That's the, the man is awake. The Mac Daddy. Yeah, so everybody else is like, dang, he's still here. <laughs> Yeah. Be quiet. He done whipped all of us. You kill him. It, I mean, you know, and it might not be, but a, a, a daggum turkey with one inch spurs that just is meaner than the rest, just like deer. Right. You know, yeah. it might, your dominant buck may be a three year old eight point that just can whip everything out there. Exactly. You know? But you get that 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 boss gobbler out of there. Like you'd be surprised at how many more gobblers will start gobbling, more more turkeys will move in. Like they're a territorial dude, just like deer. And if you, I run trail cameras basically 365 days a year. So I, I keep track of deer, turkeys, what all that's going on, and hogs. I'm going to talk about that. Dude, but, you read up. Yeah. <laughs> but the turkeys, a few weeks ago, I, I had one picture, probably the most gobblers I've ever gotten on camera. I had 10 gobblers in one picture in Georgia, which that, that doesn't happen very often for me anyway. On one piece of property. On another piece of property, I had six together. Now... Mm -mm. You're getting three. No, it's already started. Maybe four. They're, they're busting mm -hmm. up. They're getting with those little groups of hens. So it's it, that. That's what happens. Like it's going to get worse and worse. And here we are. We're still over a month. Thank you, Georgia, from turkey season. Ah. I don't know what it's going to be like. I've never. I mean, I've hunted them, of course, the second week of the, of the season. That now is the first week of the season. But usually, at opening weekend of turkey season for I don't know how many years now. My dad and I, or my dad or I together, have killed a turkey, or, yeah. or, or multiple turkeys. And there's been years I've been tagged out by the first Friday of the season. Oh, that's so, sad. So now it's <laughs> now I'm like, I guess I just got to figure it out, you know. I mean, I've killed them all all season long, but I just I don't I don't know. I guess that's by design. I guess they want us to, to give them a break and see what happens here in Georgia. But yeah, and we'll, we'll you know, see. not good. We actually had dinner with the uh, DNR commissioner a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you know, and I I can get it to a point as far as 
uh, you know, wanting to, wanting some hens to be bred up before the gobblers start getting taken out and all that. And, uh, but I don't know. It's just another, uh, uh, just a time, time lapse to actually get back there in the woods again. And then like last year, opening the first two, op the first two days of season and, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the woods but not you know so much turkey hunting the first two days of season last year were unlike anything that i've ever experienced in the woods uh we got in early and just you know, through some early season scouting and stuff the first two days of season we were smack dab in the middle of about anywhere from 15 to 25 roosted birds and uh the just that experience alone and, and and that's another thing i like about turkey hunting you cannot kill a bird and walk out of the woods feeling like you've had the most amazing day ever <laughs> and that was one of those the first two days of the season we didn't kill a bird my cousin missed one uh we didn't kill one either of those first two days but those two days of the season you talk about and that's the thing in those times in life the air smells sweeter, the sun's brighter, the sky's bluer. Like you are living, you know, like you are alive in those moments. And the, the first two days of the turkey season last year, like it just, I just fell in love with it even, even more so than I was. Welcome to the club, man. Seriously. <laughs> well, and see, that's the thing. When you, when you feel that you want people, whether it's turkey hunting, whether it's deer hunting, I know we keep going back to it. But you want people to feel comfortable stepping into this world and experiencing those same kind of things. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just awesome. Well, I'm ready to do it. I know you're ready to do it. It's coming. Nothing like them cool, crisp, clear mornings when they're just rattling the shingles off the roof and you can get in there and mm -hmm. get one shot, man. But mm -hmm. we, we have probably, this was probably the longest podcast Backwards Life has ever had. So kudos. How to, far are we into you. it? Oh, I don't even know. It's probably an hour so <laughs> okay yeah but another well, typical phone conversation no, no this is this is a normal phone conversation between scott and i that's just what we, we just do. finally got one recorded <laughs> that's right we got one recorded we'll do it again soon we'll do it again um Heck yeah well so for everybody out there listen where can they check out horny deer sense so horny deer uh it's probably safer to just type it in than google it uh <laughs> yeah. well horny deer <laughs> Uh, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook as well. Uh, admittedly, I need to get back uh, in the consistent mode that Mike and I were talking about earlier. Uh, we've got some uh, some cool podcasts lined up that we'll be putting out soon. The Horny Deer Sense podcast. Mike will be on that one, I'm sure, at some point soon. Uh, but yeah, well, I'm going to do a stock stock tank summer podcast for just for you, so we can tell you Dude. the step by step process to build one of these things for you i would life. love to no joke uh it, it's gonna happen it's just uh, a matter of uh when instead of if but i will absolutely be leaning on you for that <laughs> you got it man well man thanks for your time i know you're you're busy as i am this time of the year but um it's always a pleasure my friend absolutely appreciate the invite brother all right y'all be good out there enjoy your week hopefully uh you'll be in the turkey woods for long Check out some horny deer scents, especially when it gets closer to midsummer. You need to stock up. Keep that keep that backpack full of them because uh, make them spikes and bucks do crazy stuff. Yeah, come on. <laughs>